Because I guess all the animosity had, had burnt out of us, really. I mean, we'd, we've been on tour so much together that we all, quite frankly, got on each other's nerves. Um, plus, we had uh, business pressures, really severe business pressures, which aggravated the situation. And um, I guess four years of thinking that we were never going to play together again kind of cleared the air. You know, extremely clear the air because we we get on better now than we ever did. Really. So, what was it like the first time you were all together in a room? It was really good. It was a good. It was a good feeling. You know, because it. I mean, there are two sad things about the fact that we'd 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 not actually split up, but that we were never going to get back together again. One was we had a great legacy of songs that we'd spent a lot of time and sweat writing over the years, and we we could never um, play them again mm. you know and so you'd lost this legacy and we'd already lost the legacy once in Joy Division we'd lost all the songs but um, it was a good feeling that we could possibly play these songs again but the other thing was was that we'd all been through so much together you know we'd been through the death of Ian Curtis uh, various very strenuous things another death of our producer a nervous breakdown amongst someone who, someone who worked for us and, and extreme business and gang related problems in Manchester we've been through all this and then, then we'd not survived at the end of it it was a bit sad really so it's good not to give up it's a good thing doing a lot of interviews and also stuff like you did the Rock Family Trees as well yeah. a couple of months ago when you're constantly rehashing stuff does it get easier each time you tell it no, I don't I don't mind talking about my past I, it's not I don't find it awful um, if I was doing like 20 interviews a day which sometimes you do when you I remember being in Germany once I did 21 interviews in a day and constantly asking re answering the same question over and over again it does get on your nerves then but if you're not doing too much it's not I've just finished a new electronic album called Twisted Tenderness. Um, Stephen Gillino have just finished a new album with the other two. And Hooky's halfway through an album with Monaco. And what we're going to do is we're going to finish those... And I'm not going to say project because I hate the word. Those are the bands. We're going to finish those, um, promote them, maybe do some gigs, and then we're going to start writing with New Order. So I think we are going to write a new New Order album, but it won't be until the spring... But hopefully we can keep the other the other um, groups going as well. But we'll see. You know, we have to take things day by day, really, and see how things work out. It's quite nice, London. It? Well, one of the things about the you know the new order getting back together is 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 you sh you should never plan too far ahead because you you don't know what the hell is going to happen. Mm. I mean, I never ever thought new order would get back together again. Um, but you don't know what's around the next corner, do you? But that's what makes life. Uh, it's a good thing. Interesting, yeah. 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 Um, Anthony from Paris says that uh, now you're sort of all older and wiser. Mm -hmm. How have your influences changed? Musical influences changed? Or have they? Well, I can only think of a couple of occasions where I've taken outside influence and, and, and brought it into my writing. One would probably be in Joy Division, we, were, we really liked the idiot. Um, a Lust for Life by Iggy Pop and that was a kind of external musical influence on, on um, Music of Joy Division and probably Blue Monday was influenced by um, God, some high energy tracks around at that time but most of the time um, I write music personally that, that comes from my own imagination and that's not influenced by um, other bands or other types of music are you one of these people who just gets inspiration when you're on the bus? Or well, you know, I write, I write my music about me and not just lyrics, that is. I, 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 I write it about me and feelings that I have. I don't listen to like what's happening in the charts and try and write mm -hmm. a record like that because um, I, um, I can't do that. So does it come about that you've written a lyric, you're thinking of some music? Well, what we'll do is I'll write the music first because um, I'm not just a lute writer, right? Mm -hmm. Guitar and keyboards as well. Sure. And I'll I'll make a tape of, of my my, my uh, backing track, and then just listen to it with a completely blank mind, and think of a melody. And then when I've got the melody, I'll listen to that with a completely blank mind, and, and the words will 
it'll just pop into my head. I mean, I might have to sit around for like 12 hours <laughs> before anything starts happening, but um, that's the way I write. That's the it's probably quite useful if something a bit traumatic or something that's pissed you off happened earlier on in the day. Um, Does that help? Well, what I find helps is having an unfeasibly large mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> And you, and you sit there and you think, well, if 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 I uh, if, if I don't write anything today, I'm going to lose my house. Um, it's kind of um, have a bite in your ass syndrome. Good driving force. Really. <laughs> yeah. Um, Phil McGladdery from Oldham. Um, he says, New Order have written millions of really good songs. Mm -hmm. What are your three personal favourites? Have you got three personal favourites you could? Okay. Um, I like Atmosphere, um, by Joy Division. I like Regret by New Order. Third one. Oh golly gosh. Um it changes, it changes. I think it's it's different for me because of some songs like Blue Monday I've played thousands of times on stage, so therefore I won't have a, a true perspective on it. And um you know, I won't like it because I've played it so many times. Probably at the moment, um a new version of True Faith that we're playing live, I really like. Um, I'm the wrong person to ask, really, because my perspective is, is coloured by the amount of times I play the song. And when you're in a different mood, you tend to play different songs. I couldn't even tell you what my favourite song is, not by any order. No. But when, you, when you're on stage as well, do you mm -hmm. hear an opening to a song and think, oh, I can't wait to sing this? Do you get really excited about it? No, I just because I just uh, now because you're worried about getting it right. You're just like right. What's the next lyric? What comes next? Oh shit! I've got to play a guitar break here. Oh, it's coming up! It's coming up! Don't forget the lyric. You just try. To, I'm not very good at doing two things at the same time, and I have to play guitar and sing at the same time sometimes. And then, uh, you know, I, I, I can't even move two legs at the same time. You know, I'm not. Uh, Dualistically endowed. Bloody hell, that was a posh <laughs> expression. Um, Manor from Sydney, Australia. Blue Monday's been released loads of times over the past decade. Does this song have a really deep meaning? Does it have a deep meaning? Mm. No, it doesn't, no. It's just... I mean, the, the, when we wrote Blue Monday, there was no electronic dance music around. No one was playing it live, save parts for the Human League who don't get enough credit for what they do Cabaret Voltaire mm. and the group from Sheffield and there wasn't any groups doing it so really I, I kind of saw a gap in the market I thought there's, there, there may be like two or three electronic records around I thought if we write an electronic song and then play it live it'll blow people's heads off um, and also, we won't have to do much. <laughs> um, we can just press a button and let it all go. And it was a flash of inspiration, shall we say. I was going out to a lot of clubs as well at the time. You know, I, was, um, I spent a lot of time in New York. And I was going to clubs such as the Fun House and the Paradise mm -hmm. Garage and Janseteria and Harrah's and Peppermint Lounge, loads of clubs. And we started to play, not electronic music, but acoustic music that had been tape looped, mm -hmm. like they'd use a drum loop and they'd use a bass loop using tape loops and they were trying to make electronic music with acoustic instruments um, very much the way people do it today with drum loops and samplers and stuff but they were doing it with real tape and I heard this uh, very strong rhythmic music and I just thought wow, you could do that with a new kind of electronic sequences that are coming out now and uh, um, we did it really. Blue Monday was the result. I remember ages ago, when I was about 14, I remember going to Camden Palace in London. I sneaked mm -hmm. out and I remember when Blue Monday came on and I was just thinking, what was it like for you the first time you heard one of your songs playing in the club? It must have been amazing. Yeah, it, um, I don't remember where it was, but it was good. And it's, uh, But with me, when I've made a record for at least, gosh, nine months afterwards, um, I don't listen to it, I analyse it. I go, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? Bloody hell, the bass drum sounds not quite right. Oh, what's wrong? You know, it's a learning experience for a musician. You you, you always try to reach perfection, and I I, I just analysed the hell out of it when I heard it. 
Are you just like that with your music, or are you like it's that too all basic, It's like? too basic, but just probably with music. With music, I don't know. I've been a musician for a long time now, and you kind of put on a pedestal and expect it to be um, perfect, mm. really. You know, your music's got to be fresh all the time, and you've got to be innovative all the time, and and it kind of makes you get a bit obsessive about things, you know. Yeah, very hard to listen to to, to your own music as someone else would. Do you read your press reviews and press cuttings and stuff? No, I don't. I never read them mm. because I think, and this is true. If you if you read the good things about you and you believe it, a you won't keep your feet on the ground, and uh, b you'll start believing the bad things as well that you read. And I know what I am. I'm my own person, and I know exactly what I'm like. And I'm my own worst critics, critic. So uh, no, I don't read them because I, I, really I know what I know what my faults are. And I know what my good points are. Um, uh, How do you feel about cover versions of your songs? Um, I don't mind them really. Um, of course, it depends on what um, you know how good a cover version it is. But um, I don't really think much about it to be honest. No, I'm not. I think I not. get quite obsessive about someone taking one of my songs and messing about with it. But as me. No, I think if someone does a really bad cover version, I think it's really funny. You know, it's really cheesy. Uh, I think PJ Proby once did Love Will Tears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is it. It's great. No, they don't, really. Okay. Um, Nick from Whitehead says, Has getting older affected your confidence levels? Derby. Has getting older affected my confidence levels? Yeah. Well, yeah, in a strange sort of way that I never thought it would. You see, as you get older, if you're successful, you tend to get all the things in life that you really want. You might not get everything in life that you really want, but you get your nice house, you know, nice girlfriend, all the things that you ever want, really. So, you, you, ask me the question again. Have I've your gone. confidence levels um, risen? Right. You know, with age, have you gained? Yeah, because really, if I lost, I've got nothing to lose really now. Mm. I've got nothing to lose because I've done what I wanted to do. The only thing, that if everything went horribly wrong, the only thing I've got to lose really is the ability to get my music across to people. And I've already got a lot of music across to people. So it won't be the end of the world, you know. Mm. And uh, I've got kids, and I find the thing about having kids is that um, it shows you that if everything in the world crumbled, you've still got your kids, you know, and they can make you happy even in a, a worse situation, you know. Are you good at schmoozing? What does schmooze mean? You know, schmoozing like Mr. Showbiz, talking bullshit to people in big <laughs> rooms when they come and sort of, you know, come to your record releases and stuff. Are you good at that? No, I'm shit at that, no. How do you get, no. how do you get by that? I don't even like talking to people, to be honest. <laughs> I'll be off. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Charming. <laughs> you mean, oh, bullshitting people? Well, yeah, you know, Yeah. people come to your record launch, people come to your gig, you're No, again, because I'm, 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 these days, I'm not asked, because I ain't got anything to lose, you know. The worst thing that could happen is they hate me. And um, you know they won't put my records out. Or, mm. But if that's the way it's got to be, that's the way it's got to be. A few years ago, you know, I would have schmoozed, but now um, if people don't like me, I can't very really do much about that. And it's Allah's will, the will of Allah. <laughs> and uh, life's going to be what life's going to be, and that's what all you can do about it. Really. You can spot a hanger on now, can you as well? must get easier. Yeah, it? I can, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very much so. I mean, mm. I re the only one thing I hate about situations like that is if I'm with my girlfriend and people talk to me and then I'll introduce them to my girlfriend mm. and they'll go, Hi, yeah, so Bernard, um, mm -hmm. and they'll ignore her completely. Mm. And I find that um, that's the only thing I find really offensive. Um, do you say anything or do you just let it pass and move on as quickly as possible? 
I say, excuse me while I go and talk to someone slightly more interesting. That's and, a good uh, expression, that manic expression or that. And walk off. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> right, this comes from Liam Bruce. And he says, now you're back on terms with Hookie. Has he, has he rectified his finger licking ritual after eating a packet of crisps? <laughs> <laughs> no, Hookie denied this uh, habit. What we're talking about here is the fact that. Uh, so I got asked what were the things you know I said that after a group being together for so long so that things get on your nerves and I, I got asked well what got on your nerves and I said well after all he used to eat a packet of crisps he used to suck his fingers after now he denies it but he did do it and it's a horrible habit um, but he stopped doing it now yes mm. actually he's not he's not eating any crisps in front of me <laughs> so <laughs> what I'll do next rehearsal, I'll, I'll put a packet of crisp there mm. and see if he does it. And then if he does do it, I go, there you go, there you go. That'll be my proof. <laughs> so, uh, Driving crazy, I'll yeah. be looking at him. What would it take for you to let hello into your gracious dining room? I don't think I would because um, my private life is private, really. And. Uh, I'm not kind of that kind of artiste that likes to expose his uh, domestic side, really. You know, I have talked about my girlfriend a couple of times. Uh, I wouldn't let him do it now. Unless they offered me an unfeasibly large amount of money or drugs, perhaps. Hell, I wouldn't do that, though, would I? <laughs> I've got to say that, of all the people I've interviewed, you're probably the most level-headed. Seriously, and I've interviewed a lot of people in the yeah. business. And one question, final question I want to ask you, is what's the one lesson you've That's learned? That's because I'm holding, I'm holding on tight. Oh, no! Yeah, <laughs> I'm holding on tight. If I, uh, if I let go, I'm uh, not very level-headed at all. I'm a Nicky. She can vouch for it. <laughs> okay, if I let, when I let go, I go off my... Uh, I go off my nut. And, uh, but maybe, maybe that's why you're so <laughs> level-headed, though, because so you allow yourself to do that at times. I've got deep control inside. I'm hanging on by my fingernails. <laughs>